Jimmy K here, Metal Voice. Look at this. John Michael Thor. So good to see you. The man, the myth, and the legend. Right here in Hollywood, California. Ready to rock the whiskey a go go with this band. Absolutely. There Show them the band. We got a band. Hey, hey. <laughs> tremendous, tremendous talent. So you guys came all the way from Minneapolis and. Well, he came from Bush. Denver. Denver. Yep, Minneapolis. I'm yeah. St. Paul. Our drummer's Minneapolis. Yeah. Excellent. What are your names? Tell me. Talk to me. I'm John Leibel. I play lead guitar. I'm Ted Jedlicky, bassist. I'm Will Maravellis, I also play guitar. And the band is great. I just uh, watched you guys do a sound check and it sounded amazing, so. Thank you. Thank sounding you. great. Thor's sounding great. The band's gonna rock whiskey tonight, so it's great to be here. So we wanna talk to you. Today's like a special day. You're, you're, releasing, yeah. um, you're releasing an album, aren't you? Or That's right, today is Thor's day. And tomorrow, actually, on April 26th, we are releasing the new album, Hammer of Justice. And it, not only that, we also have, it's gonna be combined, it's a special power pack. There's also going to be the DVD of the full movie of Return of the Thunderhawk, where it carries on where I Am Thor left off. So that's a documentary. Documentary, that's, that's right. That's number two. Yes. The first one's I Am Thor, so now it's yes. Return of the Thunderhawk. That's right. And uh, actually, Ted Jedlicki had a big part in directing. He wants to be a big director in the movie business. That's why he's down here in Hollywood talking to different people, passing out his cards. And uh, no, John Live Bell's passing his card. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Everybody wants to be a star. You know what it's like. You know? Yeah, well, you're in the right town for that. Yeah. So uh, just got to know the right people, I guess. Whoever they are, let me know. Yeah, that's why you, <laughs> you help me out. Yeah, yeah, you know, we, are, we all need to know those kind of people. Yeah, uh, but if I could uh, sing as good as you tonight, I'll be in good shape. Oh, uh, you can sing better than me because you're Thor, so uh, <laughs> you can bend steel and yeah. blow up hot water in bottles and, like, like, that's a perfect question. So tell me, Thor, how, how, do, how did you do all that? Where did you learn, like, you know, I wanted to join the circus, but I just didn't, you know, yeah. know how to... I didn't know how to be like Gene Simmons and like spit fire like 20 feet and you well, know. Well, that's just it. I saw Gene Simmons spit fire and, and, and breathe fire and, and I saw Alice Cooper hang himself. So I thought, okay, I just won the Mr. Universe title and uh, Mr. Teenage America and all that stuff in bodybuilding at a young age when I was 19. And I was also playing bass in the band. So I thought music and muscle go together. I really felt that, and so I wanted to be this character on, on stage, like a superhuman character that could bend steel uh, and blow up hot water bottles to show the power of the lungs, smash concrete blocks on my chest and on my head. You did all this stuff on stage? Yes, on stage. And I learned it from from very, like Chuck Sipes, uh, Mr. Universe, showed me how to, to bend uh, steel, and, and uh, Doug Hepburn, the well, world's strongest man showed me how to blow up and explode hot water bottles. So uh, I, I learned from the very best. But you were doing this stuff like before all these bands started, you know. I mean, there was bands that were original bands that were doing stuff that had ideas, but this is before, you know, everybody was wearing yeah. you know, Halloween costumes, right? Well, <laughs> yeah. Well, in, in 73, nobody was doing what I was doing. Yeah, the, the muscle rock thing. Nobody was doing that. In fact, 
nobody understood it at first. I mean, even before, that, even taking it back, even even before that. So like, we peel it back. You're a bodybuilder. I mean, you. Yeah. That's what you're doing. And you like heavy music, obviously. I trained to heavy music. I trained to Black Sabbath and Led Zeppelin. So you're a bodybuilder. When did you start yeah. bodybuilding? What was the seven thing? years old? I started entering physique championships when I was 12 years old. Was this because of family? Did someone like kind of say, That's hey. right. I had a brother who was like a, a super human hero to me. And I used to watch him score the winning touchdown. I used to watch him uh, throw a no-hitter and also hit a grand slam home run to be, for the team to be the winner, you know, of the, of the game, you know. So... It, he was a champion in my eyes, and he was also a bodybuilder. He had the weights down in the basement, so at seven years old, he showed me how to start lifting. What was your brother's name? His name was Alf. Alf. Alfred the Great. So Alfred the Great, he was, yeah. uh, you know, an excellent sportsman. Yes, yes, he so was. So he, he kind of gave you a, a role model, an example of, you know, Absolutely. what you wanted to be, basically. Absolutely, and I, I, I was also a big fan of Superman and Batman and... and Steve Reeves, Hercules Unchained movies, and my brother looked like Steve Reeves, so uh, you know it all just you know got me inspired, and, and I started very young. So when did you find that? I mean, this is some cool stuff. So when did you find that? You know, okay, I want to be like my brother Alfred the Great. However, I want to take it to the next level, and yes, I'm going to well, do this musically now. Well, like, I when did that happen? Well, when did I, that light bulb go off? When I saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan, like everybody else at that time did, when I saw them on, oh man, look at the girls screaming. That's unbelievable, you know? And I, I, I got to form my own band too. And I was playing accordion at the time, you know, polkas for the family and everything. And, I, uh, and it wasn't a, a, a cool uh, instrument, you know, at, when the Beatles came out with the guitar, it's electric guitar. So I started playing guitar. And I, I started a band called The Ticks, as in wood ticks, you know, like a blood-sucking tick. You know, when you're in the woods, you get, <laughs> I thought it was a cool name. It was a bug name, like the Beatles, so I started that band. And we were playing pop songs, like Beatle-type songs. But then the music got heavier, and when I saw Iron Butterfly, I said, oh, man, those guys, I want to be more like Iron Butterfly. So I started a, a, a band called Iron Falcon, and then it kind of evolved from there and then bands started becoming more theatrical and I wanted to be more theatrical and I didn't want to just be a bass player I wanted to be a front man so it was harder to bend steel to the ticks than it would be to yeah like Iron Falcon know, yeah yeah exactly you know like it's cooler it, name it, you know I mean I, I, I try to bend steel to love me do but I'd rather bend it to, to Helter Skelter or Day Tripper you know or, or you know or right. Led Zeppelin uh, immigrant song or something you know? oh cool <laughs> yeah so when you did that, I mean, in the beginning, so the direction was, you know, you have these artists that obviously were uh, sensational artists through the media and so forth. Yes. And, you know, when you got out there, I mean, you were, I remember meeting you in 1982, and this is before, I guess, uh, you know, in the earlier part of the 80s, right? I was, yes. uh, I didn't join the band that I was in yet, and I was hanging out at this club in Elmhurst, Long Island, and if I didn't have such a good damn memory, you know, I wish I could just forget it all. So I'm forced to have to remember, so. But it was a pleasure to meet you, and I met your wife at the time. Yes. Who was also in your band. She was also in my, uh, my band as well. Her name was Cherry Bomb. They said she had the biggest bristles in rock when we were over in England touring, because she was very well endowed. It, that's the, the woman we're talking about, right? Yes, yes. Okay, yes. Because I've been married, you know, a few times, and, you know, three times now. So I just want to make sure you got the white rifle. <laughs> yeah, it was unmistakable. <laughs> if, if we couldn't, if we couldn't, you know, miss you, then it was hard to miss her too, you know, both of you guys. I mean, it's like, you know. There you go. That's like, you know. Yeah. And I mean, like, I, you know, being in New York, I mean, you're, you're in that New York scene as well. I was totally in the New York scene. As a, you know, like, I, I lived in nine, Fifth and Ninth Street, and uh, you know I, there was a place I would go to where my friend owned the restaurant, Eva's Restaurant at Eighth. Uh, uh, you know, so I would go over to Eighth Street, and I'd be walking down. You know, there's Joey Ramon. We became great friends. You know, any given day I'd be there, and hi hey, Joe, how you doing? You know, nice to see you. Uh, or Paul Stanley. Hey Paul, how's it going? 
it was great to see in England, uh, you know, a month ago at the party, you know, nice to see it here in New York, you know, it was just, it was just a, you know, that kind of atmosphere, you know. All right, so um, I wanted to ask you, Thor, we had, um, you know, some mutual places that we were hanging out in yes, New York at absolutely. the time. absolutely, yeah. You know, there was a scene there, I mean, of course, New York is such a, a melting pot even to this day and time, you know, so many different uh, people and cultures make up New York what it is, and that was a, a good thing and maybe, yeah. maybe a confusing thing uh, for me growing up there, but... You know, because it's so many different, you're exposed to so much different stuff. You know, you can't get used to one thing because you're in a different neighborhood or a different place and it's like this whole other culture. There you it's go. Like, yeah. Wow. But there was this common ground, this common culture. You could get on the subway train coming from the boroughs, go into Manhattan and show up there like you're leaving to go out at midnight. Yeah. Like 11 oh, yeah. o'clock. 24 hour if you lived city. In, yeah. If you lived in Manhattan, you could start going out at midnight to go hang out somewhere. And yeah. then... If you got bored going to the Mud Club or Max's Kansas City, then you could say, oh, I'll go somewhere else. Yes. CBGB's or Dance Interior or any of these places. And then there was the Village, and then there was Tri Tribeca, and then there was Uptown. I mean, there's all these places that would have all these clubs. And there was a rock scene happening, you know, through the 70s. And then, you know, some places were becoming metal places in the 80s. So, I mean, you s saw those places, I'm sure. I was and, right there. And I just wonder if you, if you have some stories, because, you know, I know you were at Max's Kansas City. I know you played there. I know you, I think you played Great Gildersleeves, too. Did you play there? Yes, I played Great, great Gildersleeves. In fact, in, in uh, uh, 1979, 1980, all we did was play in that area. The whole area was uh, Keep the Dogs Away came out, and so we wanted to promote it. Uh, that was my first album. came out in 77, and we were signed... Uh, to RCA Records in Canada and Midsong Records, who had John Travolta uh, in in the United States, so uh, we went in there, just toured and toured every place from Gilder, from the Great Gilder Sleeves to out in Long Island, the U.S. Blues, where uh, it, it, you know uh, Ackroyd uh, came, you know, he had a ba band there. You had a, you had a gig, right? You did with yeah. John Belushi. John Belushi, Dan that's right. Yeah, and Ackroyd. So. Yeah. So this was, I mean, that nineteen, uh, that's nineteen, uh, like eighty. So they were just kind of developing the Blues Brothers at that time. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I was right there. I, I mean, and, and then you know, I, I just we just kept playing on, and then I, uh, I uh, ended up uh, living there on Fifth and Ninth Street, like I said, and and uh, you know, just really, I was into the scenes there. I knew everybody, all the guys in the pl plasmatics, Richie Stotts, and you know, and, and I, I saw the scene in the seventies going into the eighties, and in the seventies, late late seventies, seventy eight, seventy nine, there was the, the disco scene coincided with the punk scene, coincided with the developing metal scene. It, it was all it was all there, and I played the Mud Club, you know, and people would pack the place, and then uh, upstairs. Everybody screwing each other in the bathroom, snorting cocaine, and uh, I mean it was such an incredible scene. Uh, and I had good pals there that you know that I knew, uh, like Felix Papillardi, who produced Cream and played in Mountain. And uh, yeah. now he was going to produce your album. He was going to produce he? Unchained. And, and what, tell me what happened with Felix Papillardi because you were yeah. like weren't you guys almost I mean very close friends? We spent Christmas with each other. Yeah, we were at his place for Christmas and, in Manhattan. And Felix and was a member of the band Mountain and also was a producer. Of, of Cream, one of the greatest. Yeah. You know, I, I would call Cream a metal band, you know. They were definitely a pioneer of a that pioneer sound. pioneer of that sound, right? So um, he thought the songs on Unchained were great. And he said, let's let's do this. I'm, I'm, I'm on. I'm producing this record. So anyhow, what happened was... Somehow, uh, he, there was a cocaine night that, that he went out on. Gail, his wife, uh, was heavily into cocaine as well. Uh, got jealous and, and, and thought he was hanging out with some young uh, girl. He came home. I don't know what really went on, but she shot him and killed him. So he was no longer able to produce, obviously, Unchained. I was very upset about this because he was, you know, a very good friend of mine. Terrible. And and 
I ended up producing Unchained myself. Uh, it ended up, the album did really well. We got, you know, signed uh, to Mongol Horde Records in the United States, and Albion picked it up in, uh, in England, and, and it broke us in England. Uh, didn't didn't and, you play, now that's just terribly tragic about Felix Papalotti. Yes, and yes. Obviously, I mean, if you could have had him do the album. Oh, man, I just think what could have been, been amazing, maybe yeah. even, like, greater, right, you know? A tragedy did. for you know all of music fans, I mean, yeah, especially yeah. mountain fans. But yeah. just terrible. But um, you know this hits home because it's you know your direct friend, your yes, you know, someone very spent, close friend. You yeah. spent the holidays with him, and yeah, everything. yeah, yeah. And um, so, but at that point, after the album came out, um, didn't you guys play the Marquee over in London? Was That's that, right. Was that yeah. after and we uh, we signed with Doug Smith. Doug Smith came over and saw us at the underground and he and he was blown away by the show the underground in new york in new york yeah. so then you went to the marquee and he club? signed us to a management deal now now doug smith uh also managed motorhead and girl school tank uh and he he said i can break you guys in england you come over to the marquee you know and we just signed with albion they picked up unchained it all like this is about uh, end of 83 going into 84 in the early 1984 we played the marquee uh, Jimmy Page was in the audience wow uh, and did uh, you get to meet Jimmy yes I did yeah did he, did he say anything to you that you can remember or do you remember any part of that yeah, he said very good Sean this was very good yeah I, I think he was a little plastered at the time when he, when I met him and then uh, we had an after party after and I saw him like sleep in there. <laughs> now, so I don't know how excited he was. Have, that couldn't have been Jimmy. <laughs> and I, I said, that can't be Jimmy Page. That uh, must be an imposter. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> um, anyhow, Led Zeppelin's one of my favorites, and he's one of my, my, my heroes as well. So Jimmy came to a Thor party. He That's amazing. It, yeah. You can't yeah. beat that. Along with the bands like Rock Goddess. In sure. fact, Rock Goddess told me they came to laugh at Thor at the marquee. They became. They, they came to have fun, like we had the last laugh because we had five encores. The next day, the uh, next uh, it said he Thor he came he conquered. Kerrang said, and uh, we were all the rage and Melody Maker, all the mags. I mean, we just blew up in England overnight. It's amazing. It happens that fast over there. So we want to talk about some other stuff that's cool. So. Back in the Max's Kansas City days, so I used to work at Max's when yes. I was fifteen. And you used wow. to hang out there. You used to play there. Yes, yes, absolutely. And, and there was a scene there. So tell tell us a, tell tell the people out here watching, what was that scene like, and what was it like for Thor, like right in that turning point, you know, right from the the, the punk and disco era from the seventies, when bands like you know ACDC and Judas Priest and you know those bands were known, but other bands. We're trying to get up the ladder, trying to get noticed, get out there, and um, you know there was these big bands, and then yeah, what's in between was kind of tough. That was the well, there was this punk thing going on in in, in New York, and also a new wave, right, and and also rock. Um, when I was younger, in the early seventies, I used to read Circus Magazine and a and Hit Parader, and it was all the stuff that was going on at Max's Kansas City like Jane County or Wayne County, whatever. The bands were, were, they were going on and playing there, and the scenes like, you know, Iggy Pop and the Stooges. Well, I was going, wow, I gotta get to New York. I gotta be part of the scene. And I did get to New York, and I was part of the scene. And, and, and I saw, I mean, it wasn't that long, from 1979 and 80 when I was there, till when, when you know, it, it was going from, there was that disco, new wave, punk rock kind of thing suddenly there was metal metal was happening it was and then it was called metal like in about 81 82 did your yeah. music change were you guys were you punk influenced at some point did you become new wave influenced because i mean i know yes. those things and did you at some point become more metalized in other words because of whatever reasons uh, that you could probably tell me better than i can guess yeah but but, but there was definitely an influence of punk rock. Because, I mean, New York, you know, you had Kiss and the Ramones and Twisted Sister. Yes, and, yeah. you know, there was a scene there that was there outside of the, the New York City, Manhattan, Tri-State yes. area. Like, you had Long Island and you had, like, a lot of cover bands. Well, there was just a, a ton of the top 40 bands playing, you know, everything from, you know, Flashdance to, 
to um, you know Rat Race, Race Wire, Zeppelin cover bands, hundreds and hundreds of bands. Yeah, it's the same old same old stuff, right? But, so. but we released Keep the Dogs Away in '77, and if you listen to Keep the Dogs Away, it doesn't sound uh, uh, as like Unchained or Only the Strong. We got did. Heavier. We got heavier, and and some people even say that. Uh, 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 Keep the Dogs Away was a power pop album or it was a punk album. We actually were in Punk Magazine. John Holster was Punk Magazine and we were many times on the charts and, uh, and he, he raved about that album, Keep the Dogs Away. But then if you look at Judas Priest, if you listen to Rock Rock and Roll, uh, it, you know, it's different than you know, British Steel, isn't it? I mean, it's old, yeah, the same kind you of You develop artist. as a band and a, as an artist over the over the years, and there's influence that come in, you know, you know, so you get influenced by other bands too, and, and so uh, we were influenced by the metal scene, and so we got heavier. You're also like from you're from Vancouver, right? I grew up in Vancouver. So so yeah. you were you were exposed to L, the LA music scene in the '70s. Well, I also was exposed to the bodybuilding scene. And it was a really happy so bodybuilding scene. So you were scene. very familiar with this in, part of in, town. In, yes, I would come down in the 70s and train at Gold's Gym uh, on Venice Beach there. And, uh, and Arnold was training at the same time. And the, the whole muscle scene. So you were, so you were in the gym yeah. with Arnold? Working with out Arnold, with yeah, Arnold Schwarzenegger and uh, Frank Zane, Dave Draper, if you remember. Uh, Draper, uh, he was maybe before your time. Uh, but uh, super champion, you know, all the guys trained there who was, were great. Was Arnold uh, at that time, because we know that he became, of course, very successful in his acting career and then yeah. in his governmental career. Yes. But at that time, as a bodybuilder, before he did these other things, w would you say he was, um, you know, personable with you when you saw him? Or I mean, because you're, uh, you're like I'll a peer. I'll tell you a story you're about You're a peer Arnold. at that point, right? I'm, I'm a young teenage guy, you know, and I go and I uh, enter the Mr. World contest in New York. And Mr. Olympia was 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 happening the same night. Uh, you know, they have these things where they have three, like Mr. America, Different and Miss America, Mr. World, I Miss see. World, and Mr. Olympia. So, so they I, kind of do it at the same venue kind of thing? Yeah. Okay. So I was so on backstage. Uh, this is my first kind of introduction. I'm like, I guess I was 18. And then I see a big crowd backstage, and then Arnold's posing, and I look closer, and he's getting sucked off by uh, one of the contestants uh, of the uh, of the uh, Ms. World, right? And uh, Joe Weider goes, "What are you doing, Arnold?" He says, "I'm pumping up." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a true story. Anyhow, previous to that, I was going to promote a show in in, in Vancouver. And uh, I had it all, the, rented the, the whole venue. This is a young man. I rented the whole venue, I had a rock band. There was dinner, everything. And, and so Arnold says, uh, you, I had Arnold as a guest poser. He was gonna come up. He goes, you, you must uh, change, so from the desk of Arnold Strong, because he changed his name for a while. You know, to Arnold Strong, because Schwarzenegger was too long. Says you must change the date. I am coming through. Then I am going to the Naba and Mr. Universe in in London, and uh, and I said I can't change the date, you know, because it's already booked. I put the money down and everything. And I can't change it. And he said you must change the date, you know, and, uh, and 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 so I couldn't. So I got Ken Waller to come up, another Mr. Universe. Uh, he's also in Pumping Iron, the movie. So Arnold didn't like me from that on, and and plus he didn't like that was this young guy trying to. You know, come into take his job. <laughs> yeah, so after Knock the out. yeah, I did well in the, the Mr. World, and then so Joe Weider said, "Come on back, you know, and, and uh, you're gonna have uh, uh, some pictures taken of you for Muscle Magazine." So I go back to Muscle Magazine, you know, and I'm getting all oiled up and ready, you know, for my my pictures. And Arnold comes in, he looks at me, and his eyes, he goes, "You out?" And I that that was he said that before. That's years before he did Terminator. You wow! Know? Remember that that scene where he goes, "Get out!" <laughs> you know. <laughs> but anyhow, he did that beforehand. So, so those are my kind of like things that happened with Arnold. You know, I guess I really think Arnold's tremendous and uh, a super talent, one of the greatest bodybuilders of all time. I'm just saying that 
I think you just misunderstood me. So the toast to you. To you. Yes. And to your new album and DVD. That's right. We got a new Interview. album. Hammer of the Justice. The Hammer of Justice. And it coincides and is in the package with Return of the Thunderhawk, which is uh, a CD and DVD power pack. 